Hi, everybody. Welcome to episode number 10 of our Ask Us Anything series. I am Mark Graven, VP of Improvement and Innovation Services for Kinexus. And we're Hello, and I'm, Greg, I'm Greg Jacobson, the CEO and co-founder of Kinexus. So we're going to start. Where in the world are we today? I'm in a hotel room in San Antonio. Um, I'm teaching a class tomorrow on patient safety and quality improvement. Greg, where are you? Well, I'm excited to announce this is our first Ask Us Anything webinar where we are shooting this at our new offices here in Austin, Texas. So we've outgrown our old office. We anticipate doubling the team in the next six to 12 months and needed more space. And so it's just a really, it's, a, it's another inflection point, another little milestone for, for Kinexus. And, uh, Really looking forward to spreading continuous improvement from a, from a new headquarters in Austin. Yeah, it's a good problem to have, outgrowing the old space, right? Yep. Um, so um, we're going to start off before we get into attendee questions on, on the topic of uh, being in San Antonio. This morning I presented um, to a group of high school juniors. There's a, a great program here in San Antonio called Alamo Academies kind of a bridge from high school to college for different career paths and they have what they call a health professions academy and so I spoke led some discussion with them about their future in healthcare which hopefully includes uh, playing a role in improving healthcare. Um, so Greg and you know, your role as a physician and you know, the CEO of Kinexus, what would you say to a group of high school juniors about their future in healthcare? Well, for one the the act alone of the fact that we're talking about a group of, of high school students that are getting exposed to process improvement at this point in their career is is just simply amazing. I mean, you counter that with the fact that I went not only through high school, college, medical school, and residency without ever hearing the words process improvement. I think that really bodes well for the future of healthcare. And to me, I think what we what we really need in healthcare and, and what I'm learning, we, we just just last week we were at the, the lean construction um, LCI. conference and LCI. we yeah LCI conference and we learned and, and I saw another industry that was a perfect application for for lean principles and, and lean practice. So what we're what we're learning, and I think the biggest things that, that young people can take into the field of medicine is that it's not going to be just a learn and do what everyone has been doing. It's it's just a huge opportunity to come in and, and really reshape the way healthcare is practiced and, and delivered in the United States. You know, sometimes the, the old guard says, oh, healthcare is not what it used to be, and it's such a bad time. Don't go into healthcare. To me, I would say, for all of those reasons, those are all the reasons I would want to go into healthcare because there's just so much good to be done. So I'm really happy to hear you were able to present to those students, and, and I think it's the, the future is very bright in healthcare. Yeah, and I, I was really impressed with the kids because, um, in a lot of ways, their, their intuition is really, really good. Um, we talked about suggestion box systems, and, and it was kind of teeing up. I showed them parts of the Toast Kaizen video and um, had them go through the process of identify some waste, identify a problem, think of some solutions. And when I asked, you know, with the suggestion box, if you were to fill out one of these slips and put it in a suggestion box, what would you expect would happen? And there was some laughter, and there's like, well, would they read it? <laughs> you know, like, I think a lot of these kids haven't worked in a workplace with a suggestion box, but it seems really intuitive to them w that it's dumb to put an idea in a locked box. And, and I asked them, what percentage of ideas would you guess are uh, approved in a typical suggestion box system? And there's research to back this. And one, one kid said 5%. Then another kid says two percent. I'm like, yeah, that I think that's the number. That's the the Robinson and Schroeder number of typically suggestion box systems are roughly about two percent implementation rate. So yeah, I tried to set that expectation for them. That um, I, I shared this story. Uh, one of our, our customers, Karen Kilrosser from Mary Greeley Medical Center, who has adopted 
the Toyota mindset of everyone having two jobs, doing your job and improving your job. And that's, that's why I tried to get across to them that they cannot just treat patients, but they can help treat the healthcare system and improve it. Right. So um, we've got a lot of questions here. Um, one question from Jose, and we can maybe make this a little bit more general. He asks, why is it so difficult for an old industrialist to understand the benefits of lean, agile, and the like? So I don't know. I picture you know, Montgomery Burns from The Simpsons. Like what, how would we explain lean or, or similar practices to, to Mr. Burns? And I, I think it's a challenge. Um, I mean, we can talk about benefits. I think the bigger challenge is getting leaders with decades of experience in any setting to realize that lean is about them trying to change some of their management practices and behaviors, trying to change the culture, not just train others, not just preach that others need to change. That I, you know, that that's a really that's a difficult barrier. Um, you know, Greg, I, I'm curious what your thoughts there. It's in some ways a little bit ironic because I feel that manufacturing is so progressive when it comes to lean that I, I would be just imagining like how, how would you even have that problem um, because oh, most, it's still up. <laughs> but, but most of this material you know, was developed in automotive and manufacturing, especially if we're talking about the waste aspect of, of lean. And so that was kind of my surprising take on it. But I think it, it, it really is the same answer for whether we're talking about an industrialist or whether we're talking about someone that's in construction or whether we're talking about a healthcare, you, you really need to start with why, right? If you can align interests and say, you know, we're, we're talking about this because we, we want to create a higher quality product at a lower cost and, and go from there because there's no way you could disagree with that. So one of the things you learn in conflict resolution is start with what's everyone's interest. And if you can agree on what everyone's interest is, then you can start building off of that and then figure out where the disconnects are along the way. And then you right. can work through each one of those disconnects. So I think that if you start with the what, you're going to probably trip up. And, and the thing is, right. is a lot of times lean folks are starting with the what because right tools are really cool. I mean, it, they really help you get to the root cause. They really help you solve problems. And so you immediately want to pull your gadget out and say, oh, well, this is how we would do a fishbone or this is what an A3 is. And, and just don't, don't even go there. Start with the why and then work your way through the how and then work your way through the what. And I think you're going to find that you'll be able to change the hearts and minds of people much easier. And of course, we're having a little internet problem. I don't know if that's Are just on there? my side. I'm, I'm still here. You've frozen up a little bit on, on my side. All right. So I, well, hopefully your answer continued and is in the recording. Maybe it just um, buzzed out for me for a second. But yeah, I mean, I think you, you, you raise a great point of starting with why. Um, there's a related question here. Um, Radenka asked, basically in a nutshell, how do I convince leaders that they have to change their approach to continuous improvement? That in their organization it's become bureaucratic, they want one person to solve it all. Um, so maybe, you know, melding these questions together, like if I was trying to work with Mr. Burns, I don't think you're going to go to Mr. Burns and say, you need to change the way you behave. You, 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 he would open up that trap door and you would fall down into a pit somewhere. Um, but if you can engage around why, uh, maybe Mr. Burns only cares about increasing the profitability of the Springfield nuclear plant. Well, that's a start. You know, you'd hope he also would care about improving safety and reducing risk and all of that. Um, but you know, you, you can start with the why, and I, and I think the how. I mean, I, you know, you can try to expose leaders to other leaders in different organizations that that behave differently and. Maybe try to draw that connection between different approaches and different results. Um, what do you think? So, just just to clarify, could you repeat the question again, Mark? Well, so the the, the question, I mean, which just come back to that question where I was blurring them together. The question was about in their organization, continuous improvement has gotten very bureaucratic. Oh, oh, right, one right, person right. to do it all. Um, how, how can I we was, 
I was in Simpsons land because you started talking about the Simpsons and I was just, I was, I was laughing to myself that it's like, what are all the lean principles that you can learn from Simpsons? Um, so I think that when, when we study, and, and it's really interesting, and Mark and I, we've been working together with Kinexus for about five years now, and, and we really try to piece up, apart what really defines the success at organizations that have a successful culture of continuous improvement, and you really can't get around this. And so it, it really has to do with leadership, methodology, and technology. And so when we're talking about leadership, leadership is where the drive of all this happens, and leaders have to provide three things to this to this engine almost, and, and that's, they, they have to be the ones that are committed, and they're talking about it constantly. That doesn't mean that they need to spend 98% of their time doing this, but it means that almost 100% of the times when they're talking to people, they should be bringing it up in some way, shape, or form. And, and then they, they need to hold people accountable to that. I mean, they, they need to say, one, this is important, and two, this is important for the mission of the company, it's important for every position of the job, but then finally three, they, they're going to need to give resources to this. And resources could be time, it could be training, or it could be you know, simply money. Um, and it probably is going to be a combination of all those three. But at the end of the day, improvement is not something that can be delegated. And at the end of the day, improvement is something that's going to uh, necessitate leadership participation. Yeah. Well, let's move on to a question from William who says, I'm a big fan of the engagement that comes from getting a team to build a process map, I think he means on butcher paper and post-it notes. Unfortunately, that doesn't do a very good job of preserving lessons learned and the details of the process for future work. How does one get the time for documenting the hard work of the team once it's done or, or even better during the process building effort? Um, Greg, you have some thoughts first? Sure. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is I think, a place where from the technology side we talk about leadership you're gonna hear us talk about methodology a lot and, and now we're really talking about technology technology can be anything as simple as paper spreadsheets you know, intranet websites and then I think you know the the Nirvana state if you will Kinexus and this is a place where I'll just talk about the Kinexus solution to this but oftentimes when when people are in a room working on some kind of collaborative whether it's a value stream app whether it's, it's a Kaizen event rapid improvement event whatever they're doing we think actually Kinexus enriches that, that entire interaction and we, we literally our customers will have laptops open and as they're going through and, and doing butcher paper and, and finding opportunities people are engaging in the platform and adding those opportunities right then, right? So they might have a project that's a value stream app project. They're putting it all up on the board, on, on the wall. And when that needs to be captured, you literally just take pictures of it, attach it into your project, but as countermeasures or as opportunities or places where a, you know, a, um, an RIE needs to occur, happen, you can immediately put that in real time right into Kinexus People can agree on who's going to lead that effort. People can agree on time frames for that effort. And it really kind of creates a seamless transition. That, I think, is the preferred way and is probably the least, uh, the way that will create the least amount of non-value add material uh, steps in the process. The other way, of course, is to, to do all that work and then afterwards someone needs to kind of write it all down and kind of do a secretarial job. And we find that to be the case as well. But I think as people are more comfortable with bringing the technology right in to the actual environment, uh, I, I think that we find that to be the most successful. It seems like there's a parallel there. Um, doctors charting as they go during the day instead of batching their documentation at the end of the day. The same idea yeah. maybe applies good practice to process documentation. The, the one thing I would add uh, to, to the good points you made, how do we make time to do that documentation? I think that's a variation of how do we make time for continuous improvement? You know, we, we know it's important to do. How do we make time for exercise? How do we, I mean, it, it's the type of thing where you just have to make that commitment and if there are barriers, use your problem solving processes to figure out how to uh, eliminate those barriers, how to eliminate waste, how to remind yourself to take that time. I, I think it's, it's kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. If we say it's important to make the time, then you'll find a way to make the time. It gets back to that resource part for leadership. Leaders need to create the resources, and in this case, it would be time for people to do this because 
this is really important. This is going to give us the competitive advantage we need in the marketplace. So, yeah. so here's another question here from uh, Fazi. Um, how do we identify the leading indicators or daily measures we need to use at the, at the Gemba that contribute to the lagging indicators, the monthly or quarterly measures? Is there a process to use to determine those indicators? Any reading material that you can suggest? Well, I mean, I think this this makes me think of you know the strategy deployment process of trying to just uh, play catch ball and brainstorm with people. What are the process measures that we can look at on a daily basis that lead to the longer term results? I mean, I would I would think of you know brainstorming and and, and getting lots of input around not just what's easy to measure, but what are the right things to measure. So two references that come to mind are the book Getting the Right Things Done by Pascal Dennis and I, I think the uh, the book The Outstanding Organization by Karen Martin would have a lot to contribute. There wouldn't be some simple easy flow chart to say well if you go through these uh, 12 steps you will figure out what your, your indicators should be but th those are a couple things I would suggest at least. Greg, any, any thoughts on, on what you see? Uh, I, mean, I, th I think that's great. I think you're, there's probably two variations of answers that this applies to. One, it's what is the industry specific thing that your company is doing? It's like, okay, are we talking about leading and lagging of the work that you're doing at the organization? And then I think more generically, what are the leading and lagging indicators of the improvement process that you're doing at the organization? So for instance, I think you were talking about the, the work that the organization is doing. I think we're starting to develop the ability to understand what are leading and, and lagging indicators of the improvement process itself. You know, right. so I mean that 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 could be almost a, a topic for a, a future webinar, Mark. Now that we're talking about it, you know, is it the number of times people is log in versus use system versus submitted versus completed versus change of your your percent change versus your impact I'll bet I'll bet we could have conversations to figure out which ones of those are true leading and then lagging indicators and then you know to actually make your improvement culture better you would need to understand and be able to measure what is your improvement culture doing yeah I, I think everything you suggested there are leading indicators um, the number of people that are participating in improvement how many ideas are being generated how many are being implemented what percentage are being implemented I think the lagging indicators, this comes back to the question of strategy deployment. Why improve? The departmental measures and Kinexus, are, you know, the system has gotten a lot better with this over the last couple of years of allowing people not just to track the improvement process measures, but the measures that they're trying to affect. So patient right. satisfaction, profitability, quality, regardless of, of your industry, right? We have a saying that we say a lot because that's why it's a saying that if if it's not benefiting the organization it's probably not improvement work and then I would question why are you doing it right so the the work and the ideas or the you know A3s or whatever you're calling your methodology really needs to have a clear line of sight into to benefiting the organization so yeah I, I love it yeah um, we had a, a question here from um, what the name goes, Sumit. Um, what methodology would you recommend for an organization to get back to the black from being in the red financially? So here's a very, you know, it's a very broad, general question. Um, Fire a bunch of people. Um, what? <laughs> just, just, just kidding. Just yeah. kidding. It cut out. I thought you said higher. No. Um, no. <laughs> Mr. Burns, come on now. Right, right. <laughs> you, are no, you are no Mr. Burns. Um, I mean, I think of the, you know, a, a lean A3 problem solving process. You know, we, before throwing out solutions, I think we have to start by understanding why is an organization losing money? What's the current state? What's the trend? Um, I think you have to start doing some reflection and root cause analysis. You know, I would start and look and see is the problem on the, the sales and revenue side is the problem on on the cost side, and start narrowing that problem down, or you know breaking it out into um, other problems. You know, organizational profitability is a really really broad problem. So how do you, how do you focus that to start looking at the root cause? Otherwise, you may 
be analyzing and pondering and discussing forever when if, you know, if the organization is losing money, you need action. So I, I would encourage uh, Sumit or the people he's working with, make sure, you know, don't just rush into trying solutions mode. I mean, there's that balance. You, there's a sense of urgency, but if you don't take a little bit of time to figure out if you're doing the right things, then that urgency isn't going to lead to real improvement, and that's a waste of time too. Right. I'd like to add, just to, just to continue your thoughts there, um, once you understand what the problem is or what the problems are, there are going to be some strategies that are going to be better to address those problems. For, for instance, let's say it's determined that one of the problems has to do with, okay, well, we need a new product that goes into a new market. Well, I mean, that's, that's a top-down, high-risk, um, high-cost effort at an organization. So I would take a very different approach with that versus, wow, we have horrible turnover and our, our staff engagement is really, really low, then, well, that's going to, I'd really focus on the, the bottom up side of that. And as we're kind of thinking through, well, where is all the improvement potential at an organization? What we typically find is about 20% of the improvement potential in an organization is going to be found by doing top-down efforts, and 80% of the improvement potential of an organization is going to be um, from, from bottom-up efforts. So does that mean if you are a weightlifter, you need to not do any weightlifting and do kind of general exercises? No, if you're trying to lift more weight, you probably need to do things that will allow you to lift more weight. You might have to you know, work on just the 20%. If you're just trying to become a, a better athlete in general, well then you could take a different approach at that as well. So I think once you understand the problem, then you need to figure out, okay, what is the best type of methodology to, to use? And what we typically find is if it's a large scale efforts, you're probably gonna want more expertise on that. You're certainly gonna want frontline improvement and involvement on that. And, and it needs to be kind of a, more aligned with a, a strategic goal or strategic pillar. And if it's, if it's something that is determined that's bottom-up, it's typically, you know, really focused on the low-cost, low-risk, easy hits, just get people engaged. And, um, and I think that you're going to ultimately um, be a lot more successful. But it gets down to the very first point. You, you definitely need to understand a problem before you start thinking about what the solution is. Yeah. And, and just to build on what you said about 80% of improvement coming from basically the bottom-up perspective, that's what... Um, the good folks at ThetaCare, you know, health system in Wisconsin, have figured out over 13 or 14 years of lean practice. Um, rapid improvement events, bigger initiatives are a relatively small part of the improvement overall compared to staff-driven improvement. The Robinson and Schroeder research at different organizations shows, you know, basically a pyramid structure where the base of employee-driven ideas actually have the vast majority of the impact compared to the bigger projects and, and bigger initiatives. And there's one of those old habits, back to the question, you know, Mr. Burns is probably used to uh, big projects, big initiatives, project manager, Mr. Burns, and back to those old industrialists uh, in, the, in the first question that we were talking about. Um, there's old habits of expecting projects, of hiring that one key person from another organization and saying, you're, you're going to make us profitable, you're going to make us lean. And that's uh, it's easier said than done. Um, let's see. There's another question here. It's a long one um, from Pam. Says I'm leading a system-wide six hospital improvement project on medication reconciliation. We use the inch-wide, mile-deep approach by holding a series of kaizen events to design standard work uh, for all entry points of the hospital and running experiments at just one site. So it's like a, a pilot or a model line. It's going well, but what advice would you have in terms of sharing that new process across the rest of the health system? There's a lot of anxiety at the non-pilot hospitals about the rollout being a steamroller approach, trying to communicate with key stakeholders that there's some things that are non-negotiable, that sites will be able and expected to improve on the workflow model from the pilot. Do you have tried and true steps for engaging across multiple sites. I, I think Pam is already <laughs> describing the right approach. Um, people don't want the rollout to be a rollover. And I think, you know, Thetacare and others 
have taken an approach. Ron Smith from Mary Greeley talked about this in one of our webinars, where uh, you know you're you're rolling out an approach, but it doesn't mean you copy it exactly. You take here's here's what we learned. Now let's see what you can do with that. Um, adopt that, tweak it, build on that process, and and continue improving instead of just copying and pasting. Um, I, I think Pam. Her other good point is there are certain things that are negotiable and some things that are non-negotiable. Standardized, to me, doesn't mean completely identical. So I, I think Pam's already on a pretty good path. What, what do you think, Craig? And I think that as you're thinking through how do you go from pockets of excellence to a tipping point, you are going to have to, at the beginning, it's going to be a pull. People are going to be more, organizations will be more successful if you spread to the areas that show that interest, right, because you're not having to overcome getting the person on the same page and then changing their department, workplace, factory, you, after you have pulled, hopefully, the, the kind of the momentum of that wave will keep allowing pull to occur to the, all the far-reaching corners, but I think you're going to have a probably easier time at the beginning as, as the people that already had that mindset, that kind of lean thinking, if you will, are going to, they're just going to soak it up because, they're oh, I already was thinking this way. I just didn't know that there was a whole body of knowledge I could use and start applying this to my work. Right. And, and then as time goes on, kind of ideal state would be you would just get pulled into everything. If you're not pulled into everything, then you're going to have to, I think, go into more aggressive kind of change management into the areas that are the coal pockets, if you want to call those the coal pockets. Um, we have definitely seen um, the model cell replicated work really, really well. And, and we've also seen um, when, you're, when you're thinking about how do you go to 10,000 people, you know, really kind of getting that entire leadership line. I mean, you know, Lee Health right now is, is doing a huge leadership push, and, and now they're about to start going into the individual. And, and they're a really great example of, of how do you get 11,000 people Kind of all rowing in the same way. It's definitely not an easy thing, but it is. There's no reason it's an impossible thing to do, and it just takes vision and discipline and execution. And, that's it. Um, and and, and a little, and that's it. A little and a lot of PDSA cycles, you know. Yeah, a lot of hard work. Nothing right. more than hard work. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and a little luck, you know. A little hard work. Uh, there, there was a silly movie that I watched on a flight recently called um, Central Intelligence, and um, this is a dumb comedy. But you know, The Rock, the re the actor, the wrestler, The Rock, oh, plays sure. his character. Who I mean, he's a huge guy, and it was a huge change from high school. And um, the uh, he gets asked, like, how how did how did you do that? And The Rock's character says, Well. Um, you know, anyone can do it. You know, it was six hours a day in the gym every day for the last 20 years. Right. <laughs> anyone, anyone can do it. Well, <laughs> and, well, I think about, you know, with practicing lean and continuous improvement, are you, anyone can do it, but who has the discipline and the drive? You don't need to do Kaizen six hours a day every day, but making it a daily habit um, turn you into the rock. Um, well, and, and, and I think that what people... The, the misperception I think people have is that the people that are successful, that are telling their story, I think they think that that's how they started, right? And, and that's definitely not how they started. I mean, we are a organization, we're a company that has helping spread continuous improvement, and I'm constantly adding energy to the system for our small team to be thinking about continuous improvement and to be logging it. And, it, none of this at the microscopic level looks clean and easy. Only when you go to the macroscopic, like, you know, oh, the 60,000 foot view, it looks nice and neat. But once you kind of get down into the nitty gritty, you know, it's three steps forward, two steps back, one step forward, a half step. It's just, it's kind of messy. And, and messy is okay as long as you're just, you keep going. Because then when you look back and say, well, where were we 12 months ago? Where were we 36 months ago? You're like, wow, we're, we've really made progress. But sometimes the day-to-day -day can get a little grueling. Yeah, it, it's the uh, analogy of a duck. It looks fairly calm when it's swimming across the top of the water, but underneath it's kicking and paddling like crazy. We don't see That's that. great. I love that. Yeah. All right, well, we are, we are out of our 30-minute time here. So, boy, these always fly by. Greg, it's always 
fun talking with you and uh, being able to share that with the, uh, the, the viewers and listeners. I want to encourage people, please uh, continue submitting questions. There's uh, a web form at kinexus.com. If you look at upcoming webinars, we'll post the link soon. I bet we'll have to choose a date for episode 11. Hopefully we can do that in November. So thanks everyone for your questions. Greg, do you have any, any final thought? If you aren't signed up for our user conference uh, coming up in Austin on uh, November 2nd, 3rd, and 4th, then please do. We're, we've got a, a really great um, lineup of uh, keynotes and, and different different things. Obviously, it's it's more geared towards Kinexus customers, but if you're not a Kinexus customer, we do have a small number of people that are, are considering kind of uh, jumping on on board with us, then um, please please know we're doing that, and we really love participating in the continuous improvement community. And uh, so, thank you for letting us. And as Click and Clack would say, hey, well, you've successfully wasted another half an hour of your life uh, listening to our you know Ask Us Anything webinar. So, hope you enjoyed. Thanks for asking. Thanks for answering, Greg. And um, thanks everyone for tuning in. We'll we'll see you next time.